Welcome, everyone. My name is Gabriel Meyer. I'm the uh, executive director of the Ruskin Art Club and sponsor of tonight's uh, multifaceted uh, presentation. Um, I thought because there, there are some students who will be uh, joining us in the course of this presentation, um, I thought I might just make a couple of remarks about Ruskin um, at the very beginning of this, of this evening tonight. Um, the Ruskin scholar Robert Hewison pointed out when he did a lecture for us on Ruskin's aesthetics a year or two ago, that the Ruskin Art Club, along with the Guild of St. George, founded by Ruskin himself in the 1870s in the UK, and still going strong, that the Ruskin Art Club is the oldest with the Guild, is the oldest surviving Ruskin association in the world. You can find out more about all that on our website at www.ruskinartclub.org. We were once part of a growing movement of societies and reading guilds and charitable foundations set up to apply the artistic and social vision of British art and social critic John Ruskin to the challenges of contemporary life. Fortunately, today, um, we can say that we are part of a, a, a once again growing movement of societies and organizations built to apply Ruskin's ideas to the challenges of the 21st century. Ruskin, as many people point out, is one of the, the great polymaths of all history. I think Anthony, what Anthony Lane called him, uh, uh, an encyclopedia with sideburns, a little irreverently. But uh, Ruskin um, encompasses uh, art criticism, social criticism, economic uh, criticism, uh, geology, um, so uh, all, all sorts of fields that were really for him part of a single trajectory of what it meant to see, what it meant for a human being to have his or her eyes open to the world about us and to the relationships uh, that are there and to the situation uh, that, we, that we perceive. Uh, a couple of years ago, Scott Rayburn in, closed an article on the, on the Ruskin Bicentennial in the New York Times with the headline, Why John Ruskin Born 200 Years Ago is the Man of the Moment. Quote, and here I'm quoting our old friend, Jim Spates, who was uh, being quoted by Scott Rayburn, and I do hope Jim is already on. Um, he holds our feet to the moral fire. He makes us disconcerted. My belief is that Ruskin is a spot on critique of modern America as relevant now as he was then. What would Ruskin have made of post-truth politics of the richest 1% owning almost half the world's wealth of a plastic strewn planet where climate change may be beyond repair. Maybe we should go back to Ruskin. He saw it coming, end quote. Well, very much in that contemporary vein, we have a presentation tonight, as I said, a multifaceted presentation, health is wealth particularly, I think, significant for us coming just now out of, the, out of a, a very long pandemic year uh, where health and wealth, I think, are both very much on our minds. Uh, we're exploring these Ruskinian themes tonight with Dr. Kay Walter and her students, Ashley King, Katie Vermilia, and Braden Taylor. What I know I'm especially grateful for is that this presentation is not only a reflection on the effects of Ruskin's thought on the work of university students, but a demonstration of it. As we'll hear from the three papers, Ashley, Katie, and Braden will uh, present for us tonight. Without further ado, I'm going to hand the baton to our moderator, Zach Bullock. Zach is Department Chair of History and Social Sciences at Charlotteville High School in Charlotteville, Virginia. You'll find an, an essay by, uh, by Zach in our uh, newsletter number nine, which is you can access 
on our website, his essay, Reevaluating the Common Good uh, with Ruskin. So without further ado, Zach. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Again, I'm Zachary Bullock, and I'm very excited to uh, moderate this evening's event with Dr. Kay Walter of University of Arkansas at Monticello and her students. Um, as Gabriel mentioned, I'm the department chair of history and social sciences, um, Charlottesville High School in Charlottesville, Virginia, where I teach both geography and sociology. Uh, as an undergraduate, I studied um, Ruskin's work largely in architecture and political economy with Professor Jim Spates at Hobart and William Smith Colleges, who is here tonight. And my own students um, read Ruskin as part of their sociology course today. In fact, this weekend they'll be reading some Ruskin. Um, I met Kay um, two years ago at a Roy Croft and Ruskin event in East Aurora, New York. And I was deeply impressed as an educator with the work that she presented with her own students. Um, I was struck by her mutual commitment um, both to her students and to the study of Ruskin, the latter of which ranges from literary study to service learning. This evening's talks are not only Ruskin inspired, but they also reflect the importance of teacher mentors and their students. And one of my great mentors is here tonight and how we um, prepare our mentees uh, for the world of Ruskin and of scholarship. So this evening, uh, Kay will introduce her students and then each in turn will present their presentations on tonight's essential theme, and we will conclude with a Q&A so that you may discuss more with tonight's young scholars, okay? Thank you, Zachary. All right, I have to share my screen. Okay, as a part of the traditional South, Arkansas often gets lumped in with generalizations about Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, and Missouri. And yes, the Northern part of my state has both hills and hillbillies. Where I live, down in the Southeast corner, we're closer to Louisiana than Little Rock and not far from the Mississippi River life moves at its own pace. Our vaccination rate isn't as high as I wish it were, and some I count among friends firmly refuse what they call the poison jab. As Ruskin says, but granting that we had both the will and the sense to choose our friends well, how few of us have the power, or at least how limited for most is the sphere of choice. Nearly all our associations are determined by chance or necessity and restricted within a narrow circle. We cannot know whom we would and those whom we know, we cannot have at our side when we most need them. These words are more true during current travel restrictions than they were when Ruskin wrote them and seem more meaningful during our age of pandemic than they have ever been before, even though we live in an increasingly global world. Education here is suffering as small town America dries up. My local university enrollment is declining and our feeder schools are in a slump. The private school in town closed a while back and the public schools in my area are also ebbing. There are two school systems here. One is for the townies and the smaller is for the country folk. Poverty rates are so high at the county school that free meals are supplied to all students even throughout the pandemic. We're a largely agricultural economy and the primary crop we grow is pine trees. My university has a world-class program in forest resources and an enviable graduate degree in offering jazz studies. But the English majors who specialize in British literature are few. It's a curious place to study John Ruskin. What grounds me here and calls me back wherever I go 
is personal. While I was born and bred amid the petrochemical stench of the Texas Gulf Coast, my mother is a product of what we locals call LA, which stands for Lower Arkansas around here. In my family, people who continue studies after high school, the best and brightest of us, study at the University of Arkansas at Monticello. When my time came to choose between the colleges recruiting me, which were William and Mary and UAM, I too became a bull weevil. I graduated four years later as the final French major at my school and an English double major without ever hearing Ruskin's name. I spent the next several decades learning about Ruskin and gaining the experience I needed to become a tenured professor at my alma mater. Now I'm home. I'm the sole British literature generalist at UAM. I teach young scholars who seem very much like my own cousins and we study Ruskin. In every course I offer, from freshman composition right through to Shakespeare, we read bits of the master, or most of them. Studying Ruskin is a new undertaking. For some, it becomes a fascination. They see, as I do, the polymath's connection to everything we learn, indeed, even to how we learn, to the way we read and think and apply each lesson. For the ones who realize the significance of our studies, Ruskin becomes a part of all they know. When I challenge them to include Ruskin in their seminar papers, they can. When I challenge them to find the funding to travel with me, they do. In Unto This Last, his masterpiece of social criticism, the Victorian sage John Ruskin declares emphatically, there is no wealth but life. The life he envisions is not simply an antonym to death. As he goes on to explain, life, including all its powers of love, of joy, and of admiration. The life Ruskin is talking about is merely a verb. Certainly, it is a powerful action. This powerful act of life implies a vitality concomitant with good health. Those who absorb Ruskin's words most deeply have inevitably felt inspired to action. The influence Ruskin's thoughts had on social movers, such as Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., and William Morris, remains inspirational in the current age of pandemic endurance. From a virally educated perspective, we can see new depths in the thoughts that follow Ruskin's most famous declaration as he expands on his idea of wealth. That country is the richest, which nourishes the greatest number of noble and happy human beings. That man is richest who, having perfected the functions of his own life to the utmost, has also the widest helpful influence, both personal and by means of his possessions over the lives of others. Riches, of course, are not merely monetary. Money cannot countermand current limitations on international travel in efforts to avoid transmission of viral mutations. Concerns over vaccine availability and hesitancy leave even the wealthiest countries scrambling to meet their own needs. First world countries are coming to realize that until humans are globally immune, no place is safe from the potential ravages of this killer. In Arkansas, men and women who have not been impacted by the scourge of someone in their families testing positive are growing increasingly rare. In social isolation, we relied upon our own stock of food, possessions, technology and entertainment 
to help our children thrive. But as our lives reopen, we see anew the economic, emotional, and cultural implications of our interconnectedness. Indeed, citizens, communities, cultures, and countries go to great lengths to avoid COVID-19 infections or to deny the power of the virus's presence. During our days of lockdown, health became a means of survival. Ruskin's own struggles with health, both mental and physical, are reflected in his insistence on health as foundation for learning. In Of Queen's Gardens, the essay in which he details the necessity and advantages of educating girls, he insists that the first duty of all education is to confirm health. For Ruskin, the idea of a healthy learner connects naturally to the out of doors. He asks his audience to, suppose you had, each of you, at the back of your houses, a garden large enough for your children to play in, with just as much lawn as would give them room to run, no more, and that you could not change your abode, but that if you chose, you could double your income or quadruple it by digging a coal shaft in the middle of the lawn and turning the flower beds into heaps of coke would you do it? I hope not. I can tell you, you would be wrong if you did, though it gave you income 60-fold instead of fourfold. A focus on health or its absence, we decided, would be in keeping with Ruskin's instructions for education. My students and I found that focus relevant to all we studied. It enlightened an exploration of texts from across spans of time and throughout cultures. Three of my students this evening want to share with you the results of their research this year. Each of them studied in a different class from me, yet all of them wrote papers on the same theme, health is wealth. Ashley King studied with me in a class on the British novel she sees a connection between Ruskin's ideas and mental health in a book by Robert Louis Stevenson. Okay, Ashley, let's begin. The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in Risking Mental Health, Dr. Jekyll's Gamble. As humans, we persevere to keep living, some fighting harder than others. Health is paramount in the fight to enjoy life, and mental health is key to survival. In the late 19th century, mental illness was taboo. A person considered mentally ill was no longer recognized as a person. If someone suffered from mental illness, the condition was either kept secret or resulted in loss of status with society. I'm trying to change my thing. I'm sorry. Oops. Robert Louis Stevenson's novella, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde demonstrates the importance of maintaining a respectable position in society. Dr. Henry Jekyll wishes to indulge his basest desires through a guise of his own creation, an alternate personality. He took, he took a risk through his science experiment and gamble, gambled his own life. The creation is a man who is undignified, so Dr. Jekyll must avoid associating himself with such a person to remain at his station. However, a man cannot be divided. John Ruskin also, also struggled with his own mental health and the way society forces man to conform. He writes in his book, The Stones of Venice, 
that to banish imperfection is to destroy expression. Humans are a mix of both good and bad. When we try to keep only one, our health goes out of balance and leads to an illness. Mental health is learning to live with both. When we hide away from our true selves, we suffer the consequences mentally, then physically. The confinement of mental illness in society created chaos for those needing care. John Ruskin's work supports the value of feeling more stable with inadequacies. We are slowly becoming more aware of mental illness due to the pandemic. With this knowledge, people are accepting the truth behind the masked face. Not everyone is okay and some need extra help. Robert Stevenson himself knew all about confinement. He being an invalid remained bedridden and was schooled within his home during childhood. One of his editors for the Dr. Jekyll story, Jenny Calder shares that Robert was a true man of the 19th century because he grew up testing boundaries set by mid-Victorians. Even during one of his severe spells with tuberculosis, he strived to continue working and returning to Britain. All his friends thought the idea ludicrous, but his closest friend, James Henry, knew how much it meant for Robert to be free from restraints. Creative imagination allowed Stevenson to create his own world for travel. Calder explained Stevenson's mindset as the one thing that provides him with a sense of control. The liminality of Stevenson's health meant that there was a lot he couldn't manage in his life, but his own imagination provided a world fully under his command. Literature helped Stevenson from the outline, form the outline of his life. Through his bouts of serious fevers, Stevenson would conjure up wild imaginations fueled by the stories his parents and his nurse would read to him. This continued throughout his adulthood. After a dream, he wrote his novella, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, to impart the horrible truth behind a well-respected man and his duality. At first, Jekyll's transformation felt liberating, but over time, the other self, Mr. Edward Hyde, started to take over and cause mayhem. In the end, Dr. Jekyll decided there was no other alternative than to murder himself and Mr. Hyde. The name Ruskin comes from Scotland. It means a family of tanners. The word tan brings to mind either changing skin color or as we say here in the South, as parents punishing their child for misbehavior, I'll tan your hide. Ruskin did exactly that. He changed or reformed the way in which the world viewed others. Stevenson too set the stage for a mystery right from the start of his story through the characters' names. Dr. Henry Jekyll and Mr. Edward Hyde were given their names with more meaning than just something random to call them. The name Edward means guardian or protector. Mr. Hyde was a vicious character, but to Jekyll and possibly Stevenson, Hyde provides a sense of freedom for the doctor by guarding his secret. The choice of Mr. Hyde's name was, has ancient roots. The name Edward was a popular name in England until the rule of Norman and the Plantagenet dynasties ended its rule. The name returned to popularity after King Henry III of England having a son named him Edward. King Henry III ruled under restricted power like Dr. Jekyll because the Catholic League and, uh, League and other religious powers kept King Henry III under their thumb during the wars of religion. In the story, Mr. Hyde hides the secret turmoil Edward rep represents and guards. Dr. Jekyll's name also carries hidden meaning. The name Jekyll can be interpreted in French, the je meaning I and kill meaning kill. This, ex ex this explanation predicts Dr. Jekyll's intention to kill himself. He takes the drug, switching persons, knowing the results could kill him. Jekyll faces his fate bravely. He says, I cannot say I care what becomes of Hyde. I am quite done with him. His counterpart, Mr. Hyde, on the other hand, fears death, and this gives 
Dr. Jekyll a sense of power over his alter ego. Also, Edward Hyde's name presents a look into the mastermind of Stevenson. Hyde is just that, someone who needs to be hidden, or in Dr. Jekyll's case, the other part of him which he hides. Dr. Jekyll uses his own body to find the freedom he seeks. Instead of being caught as Mr. Hyde by society, he would rather kill them both. Two other characters represent the society in conflict with Jekyll and Hyde. These characters are the narrators and Dr. Jekyll's good friends, Mr. Utterson, a lawyer, and Dr. Lanyon, a respected doctor. Careers create social standing. A man's occupation makes him worth trusting or worth ignoring. Since Utterson is a lawyer who takes it upon himself to solve the case of Mr. Hyde, modern readers expect him to figure out the story sooner than he does. The same can be said for the doctor. He should have deduced the outcome after his dispute with Jekyll over an experiment Jekyll wished to do more research on. In their lack of understanding, the reader sees Stevenson's play on how men of profession are still human and lack clarity of vision. The status of these friends also corners Dr. Jekyll into finding a different way to live as a wild, dangerous man. Dr. Jekyll too is highly respected by society because he's a man of science. If people were to find out he has a darker side, he would lose all respect. Mr. Hyde, who mistreats people and cares only for himself, is shunned by society and then sought for arrest due to the murder of Sir Danvers Carew. The way in which the characters identify Hyde also make him out to be an animalistic or an evil person. Cesar Lombroso examines the way in which others perceive the looks of someone who is known as a ruffian like Hyde. Mr. Utterson himself says, there must be something else. There's something more. If I could find a name for it, God bless me. The man seems hardly human, something trolladilic, it shall we say. When we know someone is a criminal or a murderer, we automatically see them in a darker light, even as scary. Mr. Hyde exists outside of normal society and is more than a social deviant. He is the face of coming social enlightenment about mental illness. Just as John Ruskin explains about theater, the people in this story only perceive what, what's in front of them. Ruskin emphasizes that actors are more than just performances. They are also human beings with their own struggles and so is Jekyll and Hyde. The audience in the theater is like the society in the story, only caring about their own satisfaction. Mr. Hyde thre threatened the relationship of Dr. Jekyll with men in stable positions by his invisible identity. Before COVID-19, many people were in the same position. They had to hide mental illness to maintain a profession. People may have felt lazy or selfish if they took the time to care for their mental health. During our recent time of isolation, it has become more common to find the help each of us needs. Social standing is not the only thing created by a career. A profession also gives our identity a specific shape and can control our thinking process. This is clearly true for Mr. Hyde. He knows who he originally is and the importance of keeping his identity from being linked to Dr. Jekyll. John Ruskin often addresses how work should be noble for every man, whether he be the thinker or the manual laborer. Hiding work that is demeaning does not redeem its wickedness any more than hiding Dr. Jekyll's dark side eliminates Mr. Hyde's sins. The two remain indivisible. Because Jekyll cannot hide comfortable, find a comfortable balance, death is his only solution. Humans should not be forced into a disguise, which the world regards as noble or dignified. Professions are the identity of our work, not our humanity. Health during the novel coronavirus crisis is a constantly liminal state. Mental health is a way of finding a balance among these influences. Slowly, thanks to the pandemic, today's society is accepting a, 
that social isolation brings restraints to balance and may, may highlight struggles. Mental illness is not as taboo as it once was and offering help is becoming the new norm. The strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Stephen, in this case, in the story, Stevenson presents his readers with a novella offering insight into the strange case of social propriety and mental illness. As a man of science testing his serum's accuracy, Jekyll becomes Hyde and his outcome is an object lesson for all who struggle through the liminal space of health concerns. No, man ident no man's identity can be defined by his health and the challenges of mental illness should inspire compassionate care. Professions, social standing and illnesses are simple masks for our true identities and confusing the mask for the man can be deadly. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Mental health includes recognizing and allowing for neurodiversity. The recent pandemic has taught us all that self-care is as essential as caring for those we love. Katie Vermilia's research builds upon this discussion of mental health. She sees an application of Ruskin's life and ideas to studying the essays of Charles Lamb, whose writing serves as a coping mechanism for asserting control over the atrocities of his daily circumstances. His own and his family's struggles with mental illness were daunting. Lamb's creation of Essays of Elia and his other books serve as both mechanisms for facing the stressors of life and also as a source of necessary income. Elia was more than a pen name for Lamb. Elia was an alter ego whose fate was controlled by the pen of his author. Lamb was able to create and control Elia's circumstances through acts of lucid daydreaming in words. Ruskin certainly understood dreams too in their presence as the hallucinations and night terrors of his mental illnesses, and also as the potential improvements of the world around him. Let's let Katie explain the connections she sees. The Wealth of Dreams, Lucidity and Charles Lamb. Mental health is a relatively new concern, but mental illness has been around as long as stress has existed. Literary geniuses often suffer from such ailments, but none more notably than Charles Lamb. Charles Lamb was responsible for his sister, Mary, who had mental problems and Lamb himself suffered from depression, but even so, he persisted in his accounting career. Writing helped Lamb cope. He wrote Essays of Elia, in which he, Elia, and his sister, cousin Bridget, live a blissful life. Charles Lamb's essays are lucid daydreams. When people lucid dream, they normally sleep, but not in Lamb's case. He writes his dreams down in the form of essays. From his lucid daydreams, Charles Lamb creates an imaginary world that he is aware of. The relationship between John Ruskin and David Downs reminds me of that between Charles and Mary Lamb. Ruskin had ideas that were far beyond his time and Downs was dispatched to put those ideas into practice. When Ruskin suffered from mental disorders, Downs accredited Ruskin's illness to overwork for the benefit of the people. John Ruskin worked to make the world a better place. He did so to the point of his own mental health suffering. None saw that quite as poignantly as his servants. Like Charles and Mary Lamb depended upon one another for support, Downs and his fellow servants were people Ruskin could trust to support his writing. 
For the past year, we have been separated because of the pandemic. Social distancing guidelines and an emphasis on staying home led to a decrease in social interaction for many people. Separation like this is hard. Lucid dreaming may offer people a way to cope with this feeling of separation. The mental state of a lucid dreamer is debatable. That liminal space spent in dreamland is a disassociation with reality, which can lead to a depressive state that is difficult to overcome. Dreaming can be harmful if indulged in excess. If one were to get caught up in a dream while driving and swerve off the road, that would be disastrous. Charles Lamb was not constantly lost in dreamland though. He had mindfulness. Lamb was aware of his surroundings and what was going on. Because of his mindfulness, Lamb was able to write in an idyllic style. Lucid dreaming and mindfulness, when practiced in tandem, can yield writings that are not only whimsical, but very personal. One essay of Charles Lamb is called Dream Children, a Reverie. This entire essay is Charles Lamb's dream about a fictional life. In this story, Elia recounts memories of his childhood and tells them to his children. He tells his children the good memories and the sad ones, even making them cry at one point. He tells them about their dead mother, Alice, only to have a voice tell them they are not his kids and they are a dream. That disembodied voice is the voice of the author. The story ends with Elio waking up with Bridget by his side. This essay blurs the line between fiction and essay. Parts of the essay are real while other parts are imaginary. This essay is a fantasized version of Lamb's real life. Most of Lamb's work is personal. In fact, Elia doubles as Charles Lamb's persona. Cousin Bridget, though she plays a small role in this story, is based on Mary. Charles Lamb's story happens in liminal space. Elia is in a dream living out this idolized life with his children. Lamb himself is dreaming about an idolized version of his own life. Both Elia and Lamb are dreaming, escaping their lives temporarily. Though Lamb and Elia might not be discontent with their lives, this dreamland is still a disassociation with reality. Obviously, these dreams depict a different outcome from what the author and Elia have found. Lamb's lucid dream is a look into his desires and what he could have had had he not taken custody of his sister. This is not to say Lamb regretted taking legal responsibility for Miss Lamb, but at the same time, he had to have been thinking about what his life could have been. Dreams happen when our minds are left to wander in the liminal space that is sleep. We are not fully awake and conscious, but we are not dead. To dream lucidly, many people sleep. But instead of sleeping, Lamb picks up a pen and writes his dreams down. Dreaming separates us from reality, but it also offers a deeper view into human subconscious desires. Charles and Mary Lamb had a very close relationship with one another. Mary Lamb was 10 years his senior and had been a mother figure to Charles Lamb. She supported his writings and even wrote herself. This relationship parallels that of John Ruskin and his servants, most notably the family's gardener, David Downs. Ruskin was a brilliant man. He had ideas that reached far beyond his time. His book, Unto This Last, is one of the most prominent examples of his dreams for society. Ruskin writes, in order that men may be able to support themselves when they are grown, their strengths must be properly developed while they are young. Ruskin believed free education was absolutely essential to society's advancement. His aspiration for free public education was one of his many brilliant ideas. David Downs was displaced to put ideas like these into practice. Dr. Stuart Eagles writes about David Downs' experiences as a Ruskin family's gardener. When Ruskin suffered from mental disorders, 
Downs accredited his illness to overwork for the benefit of the people. Downs observed that Ruskin was not working towards a selfish goal. John Ruskin wanted to make the world a better place. He worked himself to the point of his own mental health suffering. Later in life, Ruskin had numerous mental breakdowns and he would eventually become all but mute. John Ruskin was so demoted to the advancement of humanity that it cost him his own mental health. Having his servants there to support him was helpful to him. Charles Lamb's having Mary Lamb there for him was helpful to him during his times of suffering. Despite already having a successful career as an accountant, Lamb continued to pursue writing, writing and the art of storytelling. Mary Lamb may have had a compromised mental state, but that didn't stop her from being a productive member of society. She was a seamstress who made mantuas and a radical feminist. She wrote On Needlework, a feminist essay marketed as a piece on sewing. Mary Lamb wrote many essays, but only published On Needlework because she didn't want to attract public attention. Charles Lamb never married, living with his older sister until he died. Lamb and his sister loved each other dearly. The strong relationship they have is reflected in the many essays Lamb writes. Old China, another one of Charles Lamb's essays, puts a bigger focus on the relationship between Elia and cousin Bridget. The essay opens with Elia admitting he loves fine China. He reflects on his and Bridget's good fortune and how they are now able to afford luxury items. Bridget recalls their past financial troubles, reminiscing on how they used to savor the extravagant things they got, but now they take them for granted. Elia half agrees with Bridget's statement and instead suggests they admire the beauty of the scene on the China. In this essay, Bridget and Elia are shown to have gone through a lot together. As Bridget recalls, Elia did not buy a new suit for himself because he bought a book that they had to rebind and repair. The Lamb siblings had been through a lot as well, from the death of their mother to the various times they had to move because of Mary's illness. Bridget misses the gifts Elia brought her, not because they were expensive, but because they were thoughtful. Though this piece does not deal as directly with the act of lucid dreaming, it is another look into the dream world Lamb creates. Elia and cousin Bridget still represent Charles and Mary Lamb, and they still live in an idolized version of the real world. The conversation cousin Bridget and Elia have could very well parallel a conversation that their real world counterparts had. Charles and Mary Lamb were as close as the characters in this story. This story was another example of Charles and Mary Lamb's close relationship as illustrated by their fictional counterparts. Detached thoughts on books and reading shows even more of Lamb's whimsical writing style. Elia has a compulsive reading habit, picking up everything he can and reading it. He enjoys reading books that are well read. He seems to enjoy reading all things except for the newspaper. He ends the essay by wishing poor people could read books like he did. Like many other essays Charles Lamb wrote, this essay can be called autobiographical. Lam Charles Lamb and Elia are one in the same, so it wouldn't be a stretch to say Lamb was also an avid bookworm. In this essay, Lamb is putting his thoughts and feelings on display. He tells the reader what he thinks about books, newspapers, and he even alludes to his views on educating the poor. Once again, through Elia's words and actions, the reader is able to peer into the author's thoughts and dreams. While there is no mention of dreams or dreaming within this story, Charles Lamb's autobiographical writing style alludes to his thoughts and ideas. This essay is another one of Charles Lamb's lucid dreams. Having a character like Elia, Charles Lamb can use him and his stories as a mouthpiece for himself. In both of these authors' lives, the desire for a better life are prominent fixations of theirs. John Ruskin commits himself to making the world a better place around him. Ruskin had brilliant ideas about building a utopia. He wanted a place where children could go to school and learn, among other ideas that were radical for his time. 
Ruskin's ideas were supported by his servants who loved him dearly. David Downs' testimony about John Ruskin supports this. Ruskin suffered so that humanity could prosper. He was very committed to human advancement. Charles Lamb wanted a better life for himself and his sister. The Lamb siblings were both mentally ill and they were extremely close. Having to assume responsibility for Miss Lamb at such a young age made Charles Lamb grow up quickly. An event like this would have been the catalyst for Charles Lamb's development of the Elliot character. Something that comes of growing up fast is the thought of what might have been. This is exhibited most poignantly in Dream Children of Reverie. Elia, who represents Charles Lamb, dreams about the children he could have had. This story is a dream within a dream. Lamb is imagining Elia and Elia is imagining another life. Ruskin and Lamb had a dream for a better life. Ruskin tried to put his ideas into action and Lamb wrote out his dreams and his character, Elia. Both of these men had dreams of grandeur, whether it be for the betterment of themselves or society as a whole. Lucid dreaming, in Charles Lamb's case, requires mindfulness. To write his essays, Charles Lamb had to not only dream lucidly, but also be aware of reality. Lucid dreaming by itself might not come with any physical ailments, but it does come with its own special set of problems. The mental state of a lucid dreamer is debatable. People who have lucid dreams disassociate themselves with reality. This can be especially dangerous in situations that require careful attention, such as driving. In the recent pandemic, we were separated from each other. Separation can be hard for some people. Dreaming can give them relief from this depressing reality. John Ruskin dreamed of a better world. He committed himself to this dream and worked tirelessly to achieve it. His writings clearly portray this selfless dream. Like Lamb, Ruskin wanted a better world. Charles Lamb was depressed throughout his life. His lucid dreams, which were written down within the pages of his essays, show him another life for himself and his sister. In Dream Children of Reverie, Elia imagines the children he might have had. Humans have ideas that they themselves might not voice or even acknowledge. In some cases, like that of Charles Lamb and John Ruskin, it can inspire creativity. From his dreams, Lamb was able to create fictional characters and create and charm his audience with them. John Ruskin was able to dream of a better world and put his ideas into action. Lamb's essays not only tell about the Elliot character, but allude to Charles Lamb's innermost thoughts and dreams. In Ruskin and Lamb's works, people can glimpse a writer's mind at work and a reflection of their own human dreams. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Katie. Unlike Ruskin, who inherited his father's wealth, Charles and Mary Lamb had careers by which they needed to earn their living. They were both highly skilled at work which made them useful in serving the wealthy, Charles as an accountant and Mary in fine needlework. Both Charles and Mary disliked these trades and pursued literary adventures that provided them with creative outlets. They even co-authored Tales from Shakespeare a children's book meant to revolutionize education by providing an access to Shakespeare's plays for boys too young to realize education was only meant for men. The purpose was to provide boys with stories they could share with their little sisters. Ruskin, of course, supported education for young women too, as well as education for the working class. The lives and challenges of working men and women occupied much of Ruskin's thoughts and writings. His series of letters to the working men of England, Fors Clavigera, occupies eight hefty volumes in their original Allen editions. Fascination with the circumstances of the men who performed manual labor was a natural outgrowth of Ruskin's interest in architecture. To see a building was, to him, 
to look beyond the stones and mortar and to recognize in them the hands of the men who mixed and laid them, raising works of art from the earth which was their foundation. Ruskin himself was only a few generations removed from such men. His grandfather was an unsuccessful merchant sending his business as a grocer into bankruptcy. And if his father had not been a brilliant entrepreneur, Ruskin's life and legacy might have turned out very differently. What Ruskin might think of the life of the working class today has occupied Braden Taylor's thoughts this year. His grant funded research has identified connections among Ruskin's thoughts about Victorian society and the conditions of current laborers during the pandemic. Share with us, Braden. Thank you, Dr. Walker. Okay. The value of labor, working class heroes. John Ruskin, the Victorian polymath wrote extensively on the need for elevation of all those laboring class men who allow the other to live a normal life. In his treatise on political economy unto this last Ruskin addresses the need for our working men to have living wages and working conditions that better their lives. In his collection of letters to the working men of Great Britain, entitled Fours Clavigera, Ruskin asserts the value and importance of the work the laboring class is performing. Now, an invisible virus has brought the modern world to its knees and gives us a chance to see just how important to everyday life the laboring class is. Ruskin's words still ring more, still ring true more so today than ever. In the 21st century, critical literature explaining why Ruskin's ideas are important to modern thought, opinions, and development have been published. Ruskin Land by Andrew Hill, To See Clearly Why Ruskin Matters by Suzanne Fagans Cooper, and Paradises Here by Ruth Nutter are just a small few, but excellent examples. These authors and many more offer a foundation on how to incorporate Ruskin's ideas into our modern lives. The profound statement, there is no wealth but life has never before been more been truer for the world's laboring class than during the COVID-19 pandemic of 2020. When the world was told to shelter in place and cover its face, the essential rose to the occasion. Healthcare workers braced for an overflow of patients, first responders prepared for long and overworked shifts, politicians, local and global, debated the fates of their citizens. All of these frontline workers were championed for their heroism while the cogs of a nation continued to turn. Those cogs which build and develop the world and make function possible for our lives operate out of the limelight. While healthcare professionals, first responders, and politicians claimed their rightful glory, the laboring class continued their work that never stopped. The storefront workers, educators, manufacturing workers, and many more who earned a lower wage were given a, were given a label which identified them by a term they had already earned, essential. This term that has included all working people during the pandemic is defined by the Oxford English Dictionary as absolutely necessary, indispensably required. The laboring class understands better than any other that they are essential to our lives. And only during the COVID-19 pandemic were these hardworking people finally given the titles they deserve. John Ruskin called for the betterment of the laboring class over a century ago in Victorian England. John Ruskin's words still in modern Ruskin studies have never been more important. His ideas on the ongoing study of those ideas give the foundation for the best usage, treatment, and fulfillment of the, of 
the laboring class during COVID-19. For John Ruskin, the working class was not just a tool society needed for development. Ruskin saw the working class as something special. The people who put in hard days and long nights, not only for the betterment of themselves, but for the betterment of everyone around them. They create art through their actions, art that is only completed through years of dedicated practice and labor. Their efforts are the gifts they have to offer their communities. Today in our modern economy, the working class is seen as just the opposite. People working because they have to help develop society. Their skills are not seen as critically beneficial and certainly not artistic. Laboring skills are seen as less important compared to skills learned during university training. Ruskin believed that education should transform people so that they might turn, in turn transform society. Today's market model of education, however, appears to be more concerned with the preparing of young people to become specialized servants of the economy. Working class people are seen as having no choice but to work and put themselves at risk because they do not know better. This simply is not the case for most working people. Their skills, whether it be craftsmanship or man manual labor, is the art they produce and provide to their community. During the pandemic, these skills are, they provide have been tested and strained through the greater community's inability to purchase and the workers' inability to gather materials, the laborers have suffered. During this pandemic, the way we view our laboring class has been highlighted. Retail fronts, food services, factory workers are forced to choose between their jobs and their health. This is not how society, how society should use its critical laborers. Our workers should be admired and praised for their willingness to do work that provides so much to our communities and perform tasks that, uh, that many see below themselves. Food personnel providers provide us with more than fast food on our way to work and tea between meetings. They provide an experience with someone else that is becoming more scarce as the pandemic rages. Before indoor dining was restricted around the Western world, we would go to food service providers for a place of gathering. The true gift of all dining options, fast food, local diner, and high-end restaurant dining is the connection with others around a table over a meal we don't need to plan, prepare, serve, or clean up. Those chefs, waiters, and dishwashers provide their skills for the benefit of those sitting and enjoying the company of others. This misuse of the dining experience as, we, as just a place to get a bite is something we came to realize in the world of COVID-19. We sat in our homes, away from friends and family, longing again to be with others. When the diner shut down, many realized what they had lost, the opportunity of being with other, others. Retail workers who stock our shelves have always been providing more than milk, flour, and eggs. These workers are connecting us with the necessity of life. Through the pandemic, our store shelves have stayed stocked only because workers were willing to go in and be surrounded by the crowds that potentially that are potentially harboring an uncured virus. When we walk down the aisle and pass the nameless faces, we are unaware that they are taking their own lives into their own hands by choosing work to work in numbers over safety and solitude. Now, as we are seeing the light at the end of the COVID-19 tunnel, society is beginning to realize what we have always had because of our retail workers, the products to live a functioning life. Manufacturers of all kinds, such as factory workers or construction workers, have always been the ones giving us utensils to live life with most ease. Without these workers who serve the masses at the cost of their physical well being, our world would be nothing as we know it. In factories, items are quickly assembled, and at construction sites, buildings are erected without hesitation. The workers give us the give the world what it wants without questioning the demand. During COVID-19, these workers still perform their tasks 
with a lack of PPE as it was deemed most necessary for healthcare workers, not those in factories with high amounts of chemicals or work sites enveloped in dust. These physical laborers continued to work because without their determination to continue working, the world would literally begin to fall apart. Because of a virus that forced us into our homes, we had time to see what needed fixing. We learned what we truly have with manufacturers, skilled workers who provide an art of making and doing. The way our laboring class has been used has been outdated for far too long. The and the solution has always been available. It just takes effort. To treat someone right requires action openly going to those people and helping them with their needs and empowering them to do what is best for themselves and their community. When we uplift our labor workers to do their best, they will give back to their communities. This hand in hand partnership among educators, laborers and community leaders at any scale is what Ruskin thought was necessary for good community development. The way we treat our labor workers has been long debated, but now with COVID-19 demanding more from them, the debate is becoming more critical. No longer can we sit while the workers are diminished and called lesser because their work does not stand out as essential all the time. Because of the pandemic, our laborers for the first time were given the title of essential. As the pandemic loosens its grip on our Western society, the masses are returning to their normal way of life. And those who were championed for, those who championed the laboring class during the pandemic are slipping back to their mindsets prior to the virus. Before the pandemic, working in retail or fast food was by far one of the lesser, less desirable jobs to be had. But as people saw these workers come in day after day and face the crowds that carried toxic aerosols a respect was earned. Now that respect is vanishing. These workers are again seen as low wage employees and expendable. Their title of essential has been stripped and they are expected to go back to working as they did before for lesser wages and harsher treatment. Our workers are now starting to realize their worth and see the treatment they have been dealing with for decades. Currently, in the United States, there is a labor shortage. Many people are pointing to, the lazy, pointing to laziness and government relief as the cause of this issue, but this is not the whole truth. The cause is our employers' refusal to pay their employees a living wage. Those who have been doing the labor for little pay and respect no longer are willing to deal with the difficulties that come with working in poor conditions for next to nothing pay. Ruskin addresses this problem and unto this last, calling for overseers to uplift their workers. Ruskin goes on to address how vital it is to treat our workers as a person, not just a replaceable part to a machine. For the entirety of this pandemic, their newly realized title of essential boosted their spirits and gave them greater purpose in their communities. The fast food and retail workers were for the first time given a higher wage and treated with respect because they were the one pushing their communities forward. Now their titles are stripped and wages cut again. Our laborers are not to blame for pushing back and demanding more. The title essential has always been a part of these jobs and now that the laborers have lived through the pandemic with recognition, they are not willing to go back. Ruskin clearly points out that the better treatment and respect of our laboring classes is what pushes them to do their best. The wage paid is only a fractional portion of the reason anyone does work. People work for the fulfillment and betterment of themselves and others. When something is purchased, a piece of them is also taken. Ruskin encourages us to think not just about the end or technical quality of production, but, all, but about its fundamental character as a production of human endeavor. We must treat our workers better. The consequences are far more devastating than major food retailers shutting down. 
the consequences are an entire generation at risk of losing hope of working for a living wage. If we as a society continue down the path we are on, we can expect fathers misplaced for their attempts to do anything necessary to help their families and mothers on the streets begging for food to feed their babies. And possibly what might be the most horrific to Ruskin, we will see children out of the classroom, helping their families make ends meet at any cost necessary. The pandemic has illuminated our working class like never before. The result is the awareness of a generation and possibly the enlightenment of many to come. Ruskin holds everything in life to a high moral standard. Nothing that enhances our lives is without its beauty. And certainly that is true for those who make beauty. Ruskin calls for everyone to think when they buy something and employ someone to do anything. But someone will have to dig through every hot summer's day for you. And many a rough hand must need clay and many an elbow be crooked to the stitch to keep that body of yours warm and fine. You do not merely employ these people, you also tread upon them. The COVID-19 pandemic has helped shed light on this idea in the modern world. The work done must not be taken for granted by those who do not do work. When something is purchased, the price is less about the material used and more about the time devoted. When our lives as consumers are examined closely, we see what, we, what our workers do. The value of work has never been on display like it is now. The world has begun to spin on its axis again as the vaccine for the invisible villain is distributed around the Western world. Many people are returning to their desks and school-age children are sitting in their classrooms to learn as they did before. The healthcare workers and politicians return to their workrooms and offices to save the world another day. But our food service workers, retail employees, and manufacturers will go back to what they do best and what they never stop doing, continuing to provide for our world and build up our lives through the actions and goods they provide to us. The ideas of Ruskin and the studies of his thoughts can help lead us as we re-enter the world and keep from forgetting who was proclaimed essential and kept the world on its feet. The other essential give us something that no one else can, time and willingness. The time they will never get back for doing work for others and their willingness to do, uh, do work others will not. Thank you, Brayden. When I was the age my students are now, I had teachers who cared about me. They noticed whether or not I was in class. They invited me to their homes for dinners. They made sure I had a safe place to sleep. They allowed me occasionally to even miss their lectures on the sketchiest of excuses. I remember once convincing a professor I couldn't come to a night class because I had a hot date. And he laughed and told me to stop by tomorrow and he'd catch me up. My teachers listened to me prattle on about my inconsequential concerns. They gave me practical advice and they left me alone in class discussions when I wasn't feeling interactive. In short, they loved me and provided me a space to grow up. When I came back to interview for my current position, some of those teachers were still on faculty. One of them was on my hiring committee. And even those long dead surrounded me in ghostly memories. It has been hard to face the misbehaviors of my childhood head on, but I am learning. I have help. I have bright young people like the three you've met tonight to stand beside me. My students are the best part of me. 
They are my reward for work well done. They are my hope for a brighter, kinder future where education changes more lives than just mine. Secretly, I'm attempting to change the entire world one classroom at a time. If I can care for and teach them, they can care for and teach others I will never know. My students are finer people than I was at their age, perhaps finer than I can ever become. They are fierce thinkers and hard workers. They are courageous. I take them to professional meetings to show them off. I suggest they should make presentations about what they are learning and they step up eagerly. They win awards and claim prizes for being best conversation starter or for being most likely to be published. They win grants and scholarships to fund our adventures. I point them in the right direction and they show the world what it means to be a bull weevil. The three you've heard tonight are all my advisees, ones who have come to me to seek specific academic guidance. Watch for them in upcoming announcements of youthful accomplishments. They are going places. My Braden graduated last month and will begin his graduate studies in August as a medievalist at University of Arkansas. If you don't think his studies connect directly to John Ruskin, just ask him. He will be eager to explain the intimate relationship to you. Making decisions about graduate studies and program choices are the challenges Ashley will face next year. Such considerations still lie ahead of Katie. When I look at them, I think of Ruskin and the patient time he spent talking with the girls at Winnington Hall, rewarding, rewarding the likablest as May Queens at Whitelands College and mentoring all the young craftsmen who grew into professionals that shaped the way their arts are both practiced and taught. George Allen in publishing, Benjamin Cressick in sculpture, and William Morris in design. As a child, Ruskin undertook first studies not in art, but in stories. Biographers often speak of the strict lessons he learned under an evangelical mother's stern instruction. Perhaps that sternness was more productive than disciplinary. Ruskin learned the taste and cadence of eloquent language simultaneously with mastering a wealth of the stories that underlie the Western literary canon and creep into nearly every text of our modern lives. I had a very similar childhood education, though perhaps with more generosity of tone from a mama with less academically promising origins and certainly a less intellectually promising pupil. My students often lack such lessons and I spend more and more class time teaching them the Bible stories woven through the illusions foundational to all we read. Empowering students to untangle their understandings of these texts is my duty as their teacher. Thomas Carlyle's tone echoes the visiting evangelists I recall from tent revivals in my childhood. His voice is loud, profound, and persuasive. Ruskin was a regular correspondent of his and referred to Carlyle as both master and father. No doubt the Scottish echoes of Ruskin's own heritage made Carlyle's voice seem somehow familiar. The voice of the sage of Chelsea was easier for Ruskin to hear than it is for my students who lack a background both in tent revivalists and in Scottish ancestors. Reading any complex text is a difficult task. As Ruskin instructs, we must prepare ourselves for the work in order to find wisdom. When you come to a good book, you must ask yourself, Am I inclined to work as an Australian miner would? Are my pickaxes and shovels in good order? And am I in good trim myself? My sleeves well up to the elbow and my breath good? And my temper? Unlike mysterious biblical parables, Ruskin goes on to explain his metaphor. 
the metal you are in search of being the author's mind or meaning. His words are as the rock which you have to crush and smelt in order to get at it. And your pickaxes are your own care, wit, and learning. Your smelting furnace is your own thoughtful soul. Do not hope to get at any good author's meaning without those tools and that fire. Often, you will need sharpest, finest chiseling and patientest fusing before you can gather one grain of the metal. Reading well is a complex endeavor. But Ruskin's clarity and precision of language makes learning to read well much easier. My students in Arkansas have proven themselves fit for the task. Ashley, Katie, and Braden have demonstrated for us this evening examples of the fruit that grows from studying Ruskin. Considering his directions about learning guides our exploration of all our lessons. Ruskin provides an enlightening perspective and encourages sharing our newfound mastery with others. Eventually, all scholars outgrow their teachers. Just as Ruskin's significance in many ways outshines Carlyle's in current thought, I hope my own instruction prepares my students for their professional futures in ways that my teachers were unable to prepare me for mine. My students, too, will go places, undertake quests, and be known for victories I cannot yet foresee. But the lessons of a mentor live on in every true scholar's pursuit of wisdom. In all I do, I still strive to honor the love and attention I was given long before I deserved it. Even in deepest L.A., I obey the wisest pedagogical advice I ever heard. Whatever wanders into your classroom, teach it something. The things I try to teach my students are all woven through with lessons I learned and with my reading of Ruskin. My students and their work are the evidence I offer of its efficacy. Thank you. Thank you all for your talks this evening on, on health and wealth and its connection even to our current pandemic times. We have some time this evening for a Q&A to talk with our young scholars and in, in K2. Um, so I'll open up the floor to those who have questions or comments this evening. Zach, Zach and Kay, go ahead, Sarah, you go. Oh. I was just going to say, first of all, I just want to thank, the, I think this was a brilliant um, program tonight, and I'm glad that the Ruskin Art Club has hosted it. I want to thank Kay and all your students. I was really impressed with the work that you, that you all um, presented tonight. I'm especially interested in the connections that you're making between mental health and Ruskin. I mean, obviously, you know, Ruskin did, as you say, Ruskin suffered from mental health, but drawing those connections from his experience to today, I think, is something that's really important and a good way to draw new readers to Ruskin too, who may not know about that aspect of his work and of his life. Um, you know, he has a lot to say on that subject and I, I love that, that you made those connections. You know, I mentioned to Kay in a chat really quickly and she can tell you about this, but there's a great book um, by Kay Redfield Jameson called Touched with Fire. And it's about the connection between the artistic temperament and um, mental health. And just from the work that, um, you know, Katie and Ashley are doing, it made me think that it might be something you'd enjoy. And Braden, I just wanted to say that, you know, just drawing awareness to what's been happening in, the, in, in labor during this pandemic and, and making Ruskin connect with that, what a great way, you know, to bring Ruskin into our conversation today. Um, I think you all did a fabulous job and thank you for sharing your work with us tonight. I want to second those, uh, those thoughts of Sarah's. Um, hey, and you're to be highly congratulated for inspiring these students um, to undertake this work at their young younger ages. Certainly, I never did anything like that at their ages, and I am very much impressed by the kind of spirit they show and their inquisitiveness that they show. So you are to be congratulated, and all three of our presenters are to be congratulated for 
first steps in what may become for any or all three of you significant scholarly careers. Mm -hmm. You have made me think about, uh, as Sarah mentioned a moment ago, you made me think about the importance of essential workers. I thought Braden's point about the word essential drifting away. Uh, and as the pandemic gets to be weaker was a wonderful point. I thought the whole idea of elevating the importance of these workers in our lives and reminding us of that was, was a critical contribution of his, of his essay. And I thank you for that. Ruskin was a great etymologist. He loved to find the meanings of words. Um, and if you read his works at any length, you find he's always digressing. They're not really digressions. He's always moving to find the true meaning of a word. He said, there are many words that we use all the time that we do not know the, the true meaning of because we haven't taken the time to, to learn them. And we will often go out and kill for those words and uh, thinking of our own times, we can think of things like uh, socialism and communism. How many of us truly have a deep sense of what those two words really mean, and yet we throw them around all the time and sort of a, with gay abandon without understanding what they're really all about. So I want to underscore how these young people tonight have inspired me with, I'm a teacher, and have inspired me with the whole idea of, of, of learning again. Ruskin's a definition of of inspiration was is particularly wonderful. He says that we are inspired when something when something puts the spirit of life into us. Um, you, in the word inspiration, you see the word spirit, and um, uh, and another source of this word ins inspiration is breath, the breath of life, and that we are inspired is uh, when we're inspired. The breath of life has been breathed into us by the one who is inspiring us. The three of you tonight have inspired me, have, have made me think about my life as a teacher and made me think about how important it is to have a new generation. And again, Kay, congratulations to you for inspiring these young people to go down this path. May they go much further around it. We, we await their further discoveries. Thank you all three so very much. Thank you, Jim. Um, all I can say is they make it really easy. Um, it, I couldn't do it if, if I didn't have students to lean on. But I appreciate your kind words for me. And, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, I think they, they really give me hope. They inspire me to um, believe in our future. Uh, this is Gabe. I just wanted to ask uh, actually a question to our to our three presenters and also to to Kay if she if she would like to comment. I've I've been struck for some years now in different contexts um, when uh, Sarah uh, Atwood uh, spoke uh, gave the Ruskin lecture a number of years ago and spoke to some students informally before the lecture about market-driven education, for example, um, when she referenced Ruskin's ideas about, it, about education, I saw a real spark in the students. I mean, it, it, was, it was a discernible reaction to the challenge that Ruskin's ideas presented. And it was, I think for many of them, the, the, the body language uh, spoke of a fresh voice and a kind of fresh perspective that they'd not thought about. And this got very exciting. And I've seen that uh, every time that I've been with, with students at USC, for example, uh, in connection with uh, any of our Ruskin lectures there where we've engaged with students, it, there's the spark moment when this voice, the Ruskin voice, uh, really uh, seems remarkable. And, and people seem remarkably receptive to it, um, rather than resistant, rather than yes, but, uh, that kind of thing. People really want to engage uh, with this voice, that they're, this perspective that they're hearing. Maybe could any of you, all of you, comment a little bit about what, 
what was that spark like for you when Dr. Walter began to, to, to quote Ruskin and to present Ruskin in the ways that she did? Um, what was that like for you? Anyway. Um, thank you, Dr. Meyer. I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, for me, that, that <coughs> spark was, uh, I guess, I've always had an obsession with the average person and the, um, the common laborer that I see in my life every day. Both of my parents were um, average people. Uh, my father worked every day. Uh, and, and installing equipment. My mother talked to people every day, selling trash. And um, so when I came to university and I, I went to Dr. Walter's freshman composition class, so we're gonna learn about someone named John Ruskin. I said, I know that name. I was lucky enough to read um, a little bit of him in high school because my high school teacher liked British literature. So, and then as we continue to read, I realized that Ruskin had the same obsession I do, that he sees these, these common people all around him and he realizes that um, the common people are far more important than, than anyone can imagine. And it's, and it's easy to say that, and it's, it's very easy to see that, but it's difficult to put that into practice of how important the common person is. I, I've tried tremendously to put myself on the level of a common person and do common work and it's incredibly difficult dr walter talks about or she's she told me about how ruskin writes about um, like doing doing regular job laboring jobs and how difficult he found them and i've in my time as an undergraduate i had to do common work and and become a laborer to go to school and it was incredibly difficult. And that only further um, highlighted the curiosity and importance to me. So that spark came from seeing the, um, the connection there that, that average people are around us. And it's, it's one thing to say, that's very important, the work you're doing there, building that building. And it's another thing to actually take a second, understand what it is that they're doing. Thank you. If I could, I'd like to kind of, you know, build on what I feel whenever I read Ruskin. Um, whenever I read Ruskin and I looked a lot into how he, what he thought about society, I just felt the empathy and love he felt for humanity. He loved humanity so much that he worked himself and he worked on it and he worked on the stream to the point of, you know, losing his mind, essentially. He wanted everyone around him to have the chance for a free education. He wanted him, he wanted everyone around him to have all of these good things and this beautiful world. He never once thought about, I want this for myself. I want this for me. He always thought about everyone else. And that's just something I think is beautiful. And the way to, and the people who can always care about people around them and just, you know, embrace humanity for what it is. I just love that about people. And that's something I work to do. I work to be the person you can come to, hey, I need money for this, or hey, I need you to donate this. I wanna be that person who can say, yeah, sure, I'll help. Because it's just a beautiful thing to be able to help humanity prosper. Thank you. Hmm. Um, I will say a couple of things, I suppose. Um, I feel the spark when I first started going to the university, I was actually homeschooled. So I had never read any, I hadn't even read Shakespeare when I, when I started University of Arkansas. Um, and Dr. Walter, she, he really challenges her students. She, I wasn't ready for that whatsoever for anything that she gave me, but I was, I was intrigued to try to give it what I could. And she would always take us to these conferences and it kind of upsets my father because he doesn't like me going off to conferences and going off places, but I think it's great. And all of, it's interesting to me how these writers like Ruskin, 
have all these health issues. But of course, during that time, health was very, it was difficult to keep up. And I, I feel like I can relate to that because I have a lot of health issues myself. And it just it inspired me to try harder with my education and try harder to show everyone what I can do, especially my father. And so I, I thank Dr. Walter for pushing me and showing me what I am capable of. That's what sparked me. I guess it's pretty obvious, Gabriel, what inspires me is, is my students. Um, I, when I came to Ruskin, I came late and, and that was, that was wrong. Um, but I'm, I've been trying to make up ground as quickly as I could since I, since I learned about Ruskin. The first time I read Ruskin, I fell in love, of course, with his language and his eloquence and the brilliance of his thoughts and the scope of his compassion. And I've been trying to introduce every student I can contact um, with Ruskin since then and through them. Um, maybe you saw some of my slides uh, to send them out to the world to share. Um, as uh, Stuart Eagle says, to proselytize on behalf of Ruskin, um, at least to evangelize, maybe is what Stuart said. I, I, it matters to me that my students have something significant to read, to think about. I remember, um, I've heard Jim Spate say several times, reading Ruskin is hard. And I suppose that's true in the sense that reading anything worth reading is hard. It's hard to read well. But I think Ruskin gives us a fighting chance. If, if I'm going to make my students read something important, I want them to read something as important as Ruskin. And I want them to wrestle with um, complicated ideas and how they fit into our lives today, not just on in ink on pages in a book, but um, I want them to be able to take those ideas and, and make them significant and make them contribute to their own support communities, to, to my community, to our world. And um, of course they do a brilliant job of it. So I won't, I won't take credit, it's all them. But thank you for asking. There's a question here in the chat from Lee that I, I wanted to bring up and it kind of relates a bit to what you were just saying there, Kay. And it's something I, I, I encountered this, this question as well, actually, when, when, I, when my students uh, read Ruskin um, because his, I, his his ideas are so powerful and and he's you know uniquely not prescriptive. He doesn't have specific prescriptions for what we should do, right? Um, and my students often wonder, so what 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 do we do? You know, we, we have this knowledge. What do we do next? And so Lee asked this question here because you all tapped on the importance of balance in individual life or society. And um, the question is, if Ruskin were alive today, how would he be translating these ideas into action or to make it more personal for yourselves? How do you see um, some of the important ideas of Ruskin being translated into your own lives or your communities? Um, thank you, Dr. Sparks, for that question. Um, and. I addressed it a little bit just briefly in my paper that that Ruskin would call for an active action in our communities. Um, our our communities is 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 like the uh, it's it's the living, breathing organism that makes us all happy, right? Um, and it it doesn't just live off of you know people doing work and going into stores and buying things and taxes go back into the community. Our communities live off of the um, how we interact with one another, how those store shops bring us together, and how those workers who help develop the uh, the gardens and our parks and the streets that we drive on and the sidewalks that we walk on, how they build those and how it it forces us to come together. So, how how do we how do we make this like in our lives? or how would Rustin push this into our lives? He would call us to, to go out and do, 
He would call us to go to be more so with our with everyone around us. He he did that himself. He he helped. Um, he he um, built the built a road. I I don't know exactly what the name of it is, but um, and that was his contribution to that community. He had his museum that he had that he opened up for free for the people in his community to come to to learn. It did. Ruskin's call to action would be to go out and to do. And in myself, I see that that um, I try to to go out and do. I try to as I'm growing older, I am trying to set aside um, time to go out and to be around others in the community and to offer help when that is needed and try to always be available. Thank you, Dr. Sparks. Again, that's very good question. I think that's really important to reflect on is, is how do we always keep doing and making these a reality? I, one thing that um, that I personally try to do at least that I think Ruskin would encourage is not to ignore opportunities. It's not that our lives are full of opportunities to, to put Ruskin to stand up for what's right, to put Ruskin's ideas into practice, um, to, to help each other, um, to, to find a way to champion our humanity. And I, I think what's important to me is, is just not to ignore the chances that life gives me every day. Yeah, I really resonate with that. I think the, one of the things that's always helped me think about what the context in which we act is Ruskin's notion of what it means to see. You know, that the greatest thing a human, the famous quote, the greatest thing a human soul ever does in this world is to see something and to tell what it saw in a clear way. To see clearly is poetry, prophecy, and religion all in one. Ruskin himself, there's a marvelous moment when he's, when he's in various uh, uh, Italian cities uh, in a very important, crucial work really of saving a record of buildings that are being demolished in ill-considered restoration efforts in Florence and in Venice. Uh, and Ruskin's trying to desperately to draw the, the, the features of these buildings before they're lost forever. And then it, while he's, busy on his ladder <laughs> trying to uh, outline a fresco uh, a series of frescoes in an arcade you know the urchins the street urchins are underneath his ladder bothering him of course with their needs and Ruskin asks himself at some point what does it mean that I can see the frescoes but I cannot see the beggars so for Ruskin art and social change and economics is all part of this this notion of, 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 of seeing what's really happening in front of you and knowing that you have a moral responsibility to do something in response to what you see, that you, as I think as Ruskin would put it, that you, you haven't seen something until you've come to love it, until you've assumed moral responsibility. That, of course, even in goes, involves the environment. You know, you haven't seen nature until you love it and then know that you have some real moral responsibility, uh, you know, toward it. So I think that's the, you know, that's the framework. I would, I just wanted to say too, that, you know, when you were, the question that was asked about what was the spark, you know, for the three of you to read Ruskin and to speak to what Kay said too about introducing Ruskin to students. I find that when I introduce Ruskin to students um, that, that often happens because you know, oddly enough today, I think he's speaking about, you know, he is speaking about issues that are so relevant to us today that his voice sounds new. Um, you know, it sounds almost modern, you know, to students reading it now. He doesn't sound like um, people might expect, you know, this is just going to be some musty 19th century writer. And then they find, wait a minute, He's talking to me about the environment. He's talking to me about labor. He's talking to me about education. He's talking to me about things that, that the world's talking about. And I think that that's exciting for students. Um, and you know, sometimes the language is, you know, at first you have to get used to it. 
but you know they're smart they do <laughs> and and then they find these ideas that that really speak to them today and i think that that's it's, it's just so encouraging to see young people um you know taking up this sort of research and and carrying it carrying it forward so i think he has an appeal that um you know we might not expect he i think this is a time when his voice is suddenly um you know it's kind of waiting to be heard again I think that we are all engaged in a search for truth in our own lives. And in terms of my own relationship to Ruskin, um, I would read passages and I would say, oh my goodness, that is true. And I never knew that before. I was thinking of Kay's earlier comments about this. I always think that Ruskin tells me the truth, truths I should have known long ago and didn't. And now I'm beginning to understand better because I've read him. He speaks to our hearts. He speaks to our souls. He speaks to the, the core of what it means to be alive and to be a human being. And you, you read something and you say, oh my goodness, that is in fact the way it really is. And that's the inspiration. That's the breath of life that Ruskin gives us all the time if we take the time to read him. I think you're right, Jim. That was very well said. And on that masterful summing up, uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Dr. Walter and her students, Ashley, Katie, and Braden, and Zach uh, Bullock uh, for moderating and being a part of this stimulating journey I think we've all gone on tonight in exploring uh, you know, these, these facets, really, of Ruskin. Uh, and there's so many of them. Uh, so, so much to see, uh, such deep questions and, and uh, penetrating wisdom, as uh, Jim just said. Uh, quick word about our next event, which, is, which follows a week from tonight. Um, we're especially pleased to feature our sister Historic Arts Association, the California Art Club, founded in 1909 uh, next week. One of the things we do at the Ruskin Art Club from time to time is, is feature uh, uh, another historic association in Southern California that has its roots uh, in the arts and crafts movement and in that great impulse of Ruskinian and William Morrisian uh, uh, movements uh, as they impacted us here in California. So. Uh, next week, a presentation from the Arroyo Seco Canyon to the Cosmos, the California Art Club's avant-garde journey of more than 100 years. And we're delighted to welcome, uh, to have a feature presentation from uh, art historian uh, Jean Stern, uh, the former director of the Irvine Museum, uh, contemporary American artist Peter Adams, president of the California Art Club, and Elaine Adams, the California Art Club's executive director and CEO. This should be a very exciting uh, event as they cover not only their venerable history in, and uh, their roots in the uh, California uh, Impressionist movement, uh, uh, but also uh, the work that they've been doing in more recent years and a kind of revival of the California Art Club since the early 1990s. So don't miss this. Uh, for more information on this and other Ruskin Art Club events, uh, for example, on June the 19th, Saturday, June the 19th, we have a presentation from the UK, from Lancaster University on Ruskin and the Museum of the Near Future, which will also feature some absolutely stunning and remarkable scientific drawings, rarely seen, that uh, Dr. Sandra Kemp of the uh, Ruskin Center at Lancaster University will be presenting. So visit our website for these and all our other uh, e events that are coming up. Also membership information on the website and Ruskin resources galore. So again, we want to thank Kay and Ashley, Katie and Braden and Zach for uh, this rich uh, feast they uh, put out for us tonight. See you all next week.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Gabriel.